let's start here. I, I would love to know from each of you, what was your your walk or your journey uh, when it came to religion uh, or faith before you even got to the uh, People's Temple? Uh, let's start with you, Miss Williams. Well, uh, first and foremost, I came from a religious home. My father was a Baptist minister and my mother was very involved in missionary work. So I really felt that I was grounded and I knew what my sense and purpose in life was uh, about. And so our Christian doctrines really governed primarily everything that I did. And since I was the youngest child of four, my activities were monitored far more closely than any of my older siblings. And therefore we went to church every Sunday and also we attended Sunday school and uh, we just lived a middle-class life. So uh, for me living at the time when I grew up, it was just absolutely phenomenal. And again, the primary vision of my family was focused on Christianity and us treating people the way we want it to be treated. Mr. Newell? I would say um, our family was quite the opposite. You know, we didn't go to, we didn't go to church on a regular, on a regular basis. Um, I, um, I learned uh, at an early age from this lady, she had a, a hat shop and she used to uh, call me in and, and read the Bible to me, you know, but as far as uh, going to church every Sunday, um, that wasn't a, a household thing, you know. Um, being from the South, you know, um, we just didn't go to church on a regular basis. And then when we came to California, it continued, you know, although I was uh, baptized at the age of 12, you know, we still didn't go to church on a regular basis. We wouldn't because our parents didn't go to church, we didn't, we wouldn't uh, force to go to church, so. Um, and I meant to ask you as well, Ms. Williams, but I'll ask you first, Mr. Mr. Newell. Uh, at what age did you join the uh, People's, the People's Temple? Um, I was uh, 16 when, when I joined. My mother uh, brought us into the church at, uh, I was uh, 16 years old. 16, and what, what about you, Ms. Williams? What age did you join? I believe I was around 11 years of age. I was in middle school at the time. Wow. Uh, Ms. Wagner Wilson, you joined at 13 years old. So, so yes. tell me a bit of, of your, of, with your family at least, uh, what religion and faith was like in your family before you joined. Well, I was raised, my sister and I, Michelle, were raised by our grandparents until we were four. So my grandparents were the deacon and deaconess of a Baptist church. So that was our first introduction to Christianity. Um, when my mother came to, to get us, she had married uh, my father, Richard Wagner, who adopted my sister and I, and um, he was an atheist, <laughs> and so we went to church sometimes, um, rarely, but it was an interracial church in San Francisco. Uh, the father that my father that adopted me was, was, you know, white, and so once they divorced, we didn't go to church at all. Sometimes I would go because I'd meet friends, and this is when I was around, you know, 10 or 11, and they, they would take me to church with them. But as far as any, you know, scheduled services, um, Sunday Bible study, that, that, was not, um, that was not a part of our family structure um, after 10 years old. Now, if I have this wrong, correct me, but I believe I read uh, Miss Leslie and Mr. Herbert, both of your fathers were not into the people's church. Do I have that, is that correct? Yes, that's, that's correct. That's correct. That's interesting. Mr. Herbert, why do you think your father uh, rejected the People's Church? Well, I imagine my father, uh, I imagine my father, he uh, was taught at an early age, you know, this this lady raised him from, from a kid, you know, because he lost his uh, mother at an early age. And so uh, she raised him. So I imagine she took him to church and she uh, taught him the Bible. And um, when my father and one of my uncles came to the church, um, they instantly walked right back out of there because they just felt it wasn't right. Mm -hmm. And, and did Mr. Herbert, didn't your father say before y'all went to Guyana, didn't he say he's going to kill y'all? Do I have that right? 
Uh, he told my mother that before we uh, relocated to San Francisco because we were living in Los Angeles at the time. And um, he told my mother, yeah, that man's just going to take you guys over there and kill y'all. You know? Um, mm. I didn't hear I didn't hear that remark. I didn't hear him say it to her. But uh, later on, I found out that um, that's what he had told her before we uh, moved to San Francisco. So here's the here's the question that a lot of us in our community ask. What was it about the People's Temple that really that you felt really began to appeal to black communities? Because it was majority black. It was majority sure. black. And there was talk right. about socialism and working in the community. So I think folks may have their judgments, but they got to understand there was something there for people to uh to uh, get involved in this. Uh, Miss Williams, what was it that you saw that was resonating with black communities? Well, first and foremost, our black community had lost our most revered leader, Dr. Martin Luther King. So we were, as I consider us, a lost group of indigenous people in search mm. for some <clears throat> answers. And we were not getting the answers and the resources that we needed at the time from the churches. And so what intrigued us and motivated us to become a part of People's Temple was the fact that there were social services readily available to us. There were people who appeared to really be interested in our well-being. And also it was an interracial environment, which at the time, was very different because when I grew up in the uh, 70s, it was very uh, unusual to find a church that had uh, all this diversity that existed within people's temple. And so as a young person, it was very intriguing because Black Panther movement was uh, out and there was uh, a lot of, uh, new revolutionary ideas about what society should look like. So that's how I feel and what intrigued me and maybe some other younger people that were my age. Miss Leslie, what, yes. what did you see that was that was appealing to uh, black communities? Um, so for me, it was a little different because I was raised in an interracial household. Um, so I really didn't recognize color until actually People's Temple. Um, race was never discussed in our family. Um, so I think what appealed to me the most at 13 was the fact that I had no idea that people were hungry. I came from, from a very upper middle class family. I didn't know that people suffered. I didn't know that children went to bed hungry. Um, I didn't know there, there were social injustices because it wasn't um, a part of my, my, my situation or what I was, I was introduced to. And so that's what appealed to me was, you know, my mother was a care home owner of mentally ill patients. And so she was very adaptive and she was very inclusive. So when I saw People's Temple, um, for me, it was different because I had not honestly um, been around that many Black Americans, right? My school experience was basically, you know, all Caucasian, but I felt, um, and Jim didn't look much different from my dad. Um, so the interracial situation, my, my, it was kind of like the opposite. But I just felt like the programs that were introduced and the fact that at 13, I felt like I could make a difference in the world, right? Um, People's Temple accepted everyone, you know, back then, you know, homosexuality was a taboo, prostitutes, we had everybody and anyone that came into the church. And I was exposed to that. So it opened up my eyes to other folks besides myself. And I loved People's Temple in the beginning. You know, I thought that we were doing really good work. And I call People's Temple, it's called People's Temple, the Disciples of Christ, that the members were the disciples of Christ because they were the ones that were really trying to emulate what was good in the world and how we should live and how should how we should treat each other. So that was my that was the appeal to me. Mr. Herbert, was that was that your experience as well? No, mine was uh, totally different from theirs. <laughs> I was a, a, a young black kid growing up in Watts, you know, um, um, wasn't a whole lot of things to, to um, keep yourself active or whatever. Po no, we didn't have a lot of positive 
role models or a lot of positive things that we can get into. So, um, of course, I went the opposite direction, you know, um, joining the gang, you know, uh, stealing um, different things like this. And um, my mother seen that, you know, this was the route that she wanted her children and her sons to go. And so me and my older two, older two brothers were getting in trouble, you know, uh, doing drugs or whatever. And so um, my older brother, I guess he had got into some real trouble when because the church, because the church um, had all these social services, they turned you to represent you if um, if you had legal issues. And mm-hmm. so um, my mom, she um, used the services of, of the attorney that we had in the church. And so I uh, helped him get my older brother out of some trouble. So I believe that's what um, made her want to get more involved and my last year of high school, um, we had a summer trip uh, to go across the U.S., 11 Greyhound buses, you know, caravan across the United States to different states, you know, and that was exciting to me to never have been out of California other than from leaving uh, Mississippi to California, you know, I never got a chance to travel or, you know, see other parts of the country, and so um, when I was a part, when I got a chance to be a part of that trip, it was, it was exciting, you know, and seeing all the young people, people of all different ages, the young, the old senior citizens. And, you know, I thought it was, it was a great thing to be a part of. So that's wow. what appealed to me. Mr. Herbert, I did not know they offered legal services. I, yes. I did not know that. That's really interesting because <laughs> I'm from Philly have so many friends and cousins who've been locked up. I mean, that's a really, uh, that would obviously be a good thing if you heard that. Like, hey, the, it's expensive legal services once they get you in that system. Correct. So that's correct. very, thank you for sharing that because I, out of all my reading, I, I didn't know that. All right. So let me ask y'all before we get to Guyana, I want to ask about what I perceive to be, and this is my perception looking out, obviously, in retrospect, uh, I guess cracks that you would see. And one of the things that I heard about it was the um, Jim Jones doing healings. He claimed that he was a, uh, a healer. And uh, Miss Leslie, I heard you talk about that I, in one of the documentaries. You said that um, y'all would, if I have this wrong, correct me, but y'all would seek out people that Jim Jones could heal. And do I have that right? Right. They did. Well, they did, although we didn't know that until after we came back from Jonestown. But yes, they would actually... Um, they would stage someone to be a part of the healing services. And so, and if you can't answer it, I get it, but <clears throat> did the person, so they, they obviously knew what they were doing. Were they being yes. paid? How are they being convinced? Cause when you watch the video footage, it's very convincing. How are they being, how was the person being convinced, you know, come in here and act like you've been healed by this guy, Jim Jones? Most of them did not, they did not know that they were, they were participating in a scam, that this was not real. Um, so there were members that, I mean, part of the, the hierarchy or, or people that were assigned to go and dig through people's garbage cans. And I, I think during probably the, the introduction, when people came in, they were greeted by, by counselors or greet, greeters. And I think then they were, they were trying to obtain as much information from that person. And then they would pick and choose who they wanted to, 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 to call out and then give that information to Jim Jones. And he would, he would call, give them personal information. Oh, I, I, I know your, your child's in prison or something that no one else would have known. And so they were convinced that they, that they were actually being healed. And there was one person who I, who was, whose grandmother was a member, and this is how it's, it's so deceitful, is that she was supposedly healed from cancer. And so when the cancer came back, um, she thought she didn't have enough faith. And that's why she, she, wow. she didn't, you know, her cancer came back um, because she didn't have enough faith in Jim Jones and what, you know, we called him father. And she ultimately, of course, died. But the participants who went out and did this, this purposely deceived, and really they deceived our community because our seniors were really the ones that were there for the healings, right? Mm-hmm. They're the ones that, that gave up that Christian based um, knowledge and, and went, went, went ahead and listened to Jim throw the Bible down because they thought 
that he was a prophet and that he was a healer. And to add to, to, go ahead, please, to add, please. To add to what Leslie has said, um, for example, he had supposedly healed both of my parents. When my dad came there, my dad had been uh, off of work. He was a city employee due to a heart condition. And he was told he would never be able to go back to work. And so as a child, I was extremely concerned about that because we were accustomed to living a very good lifestyle. And it, it was, I was questioning, how were we going to survive? Well, when my father heard of Jim Jones, he went to Redwood Valley seeking a healing because he had heard from one of his minister friends that Jim Jones was a prophet and he could heal people. And so my dad went and he came back so excited telling him and my mother, they were telling me because I didn't go that Sunday. I didn't want to get up that early to go to, all the way to Ukiah. It's a two and a half hour drive from San Francisco. So I accompanied him several other times because I enjoyed what I was seeing, what I was witnessing, church with the swimming pool inside of it. You get to go swimming when church is mm -hmm. over. One Sunday, I'm sitting there in the church with some of the young people in the choir. And he called out my dad by name. He told my dad that he was from Louisiana. He shared with my father something that happened to him as a young man, how he was run over by a racist driver who left him for dead. He told him some other things as when he was a young man in Louisiana. And then he looked at my dad and he said, Reverend Williams, I'm gonna ask you something. Do you believe in God? Well, of course my father said, absolutely. He said, do you believe that prophets will be present in this world? You'll be able to see them. He said, of course. And then he said, well, I'm saying to you right now, everybody close your eyes. He says, you are going to be healed. I want you to run around this church. My dad was not supposed to be running or doing anything. He was very weak. Next thing I knew, my dad had run around the inside perimeter of the church twice. And my dad went back to his doctor uh, about a week later. And his doctor said, Rev, I don't understand this. He goes, but it seems as though everything is back to normal. Um, and my dad said, well, good, because I want to go back to work. Well, my dad went back to work and he worked at, at least another eight, nine years, wound up working on, on church projects and building things for them. But the one thing I have to say is in that instance, it was, in my opinion, my father's mind that made him believe it and he was able to repair and, and create that positive energy to change what was going on. But my mother was also healed supposedly of cancer, but she did not tell me until after we came back. She said, when they told me to act like I wanted to use the bathroom and I did, they, this nurse came and she had a, a, some Kleenex and she says, I will swear something was in that Kleenex, but she told me, keep trying to act like I have to have a movement. And all of a sudden they came up with this thing and she said, it looked like a chicken lizard or something. And she said, Ooh, and it just stank. I know that that didn't come out of me. And I said, mother, don't say those things. Don't say that you weren't healed. That's blasphemous. Don't do that. Mm. I said, I'm going to pray for you and because father would never do anything to you. He healed daddy and he healed you. You should be grateful. But this is what we were seeing and exposed to. And at the time, we believed it because it looked so real. It looks so real. But I just want to say something right quick. So I remember my first negative thought about the healings was I was on the island. You know, they would call someone like Yolanda said into the restroom and they're going to heal them of cancer. And the nurse would come out with this, you know, her hand up in the air with this white tissue with something that was just, you know, it, it smelled horrible. And so chicken, at one time I- Chicken liver or something. Yeah, they were, they were putting chicken livers on each Jim's house or something, letting them spoil. This is after the fact, we knew this when we came back from Guyana. But the first, when I had how are the cancers coming out? Because remember, we don't have Google. We don't have the internet, but it was, how is every cancer, where is it coming from and why are they all the same? And so that was my, one of my first negative thoughts, like this, something's wrong here, but you look at the audience and you could, everyone else who's engaged in this. And so you say, 
oh, it must be me. It must be me. I don't, I don't understand, or I don't have enough faith. But that was my first really a red light that something could be wrong. And I think you wasn't, I was, you wasn't the only one to feel like that, Leslie. I feel like that also. You we know, couldn't discuss that with each other. You couldn't discuss it with anyone, but no. um, you know, um, my father, when he, him and my, one of my uncles came to the church, um, they instantly just walked back up out of the church because I know he was a fake, but um, mm. I'm looking at all the, all the seniors, all the seniors there, all the jurors in there, and I'm thinking, if this is so wrong, why are all these seniors here? You know, because you know, you think the older person is, the more wiser they are. Right. You know, so if it's, if it's, if this is wrong, uh, they wouldn't be here. But I'm still wrestling in my mind, or you know, just hearing that thought in the back of my mind saying this is not right. That's you know, but you, you continue to go along with it. Mm -hmm. You know. Uh, let, let me ask, so, and this happens if I have this right before uh, going to Guyana, but I read that his, there were these newsletters and his wife uh, explicitly admitted that she was willing to share her husband, uh, Jim Jones, with other women. Uh, and so I, when I read that, I'm thinking, uh, wow, I'm, how does that not shake people's faith when he's openly philandering with other women. I mean, that, I would think, I could be wrong, that it goes against, you know, uh, some some doctrines. Right. Uh, how does that not shake people when he's having sex with other women? Well, I remember the well, first time, it was, I'm sorry. Oh. Go ahead, you go. It was in Redwood started. Valley, right? Because I, I was raised in Redwood Valley, Ukiah. And he was talking about, from the pulpit, that he was having extramarital affairs with women. And he would talk about how his knees are, are scratched up because he was such an ardent lover. And he was doing that to help people stay in the church, right? And into the temple. And I thought, well, that doesn't even make sense. And I had not, you know, I did have some, some Christian background where that was unheard of. I would never hear a pastor openly talking about having extramarital affairs, affairs not just with, with women, but men. And yes. I think, and that's why I thought, you know, I think back, why did my mother grab our hands and run like hell? Because this was not normal. This is one of the other instances that, that weren't normal. But I, again, I think people at that point were so, they compromised so much and you can, you can make excuses for anything, right? Anything. So they can say, okay, we have an extramarital affairs, affairs, but he's helping me with my rent or I have a place to stay or I'm, be, I'm able to eat. So it's just about, it's just how you, how you make excuses to move forward in something that you really feel in your, in your, in your heart is not correct. If that's what your beliefs are. Ms. And William? the thing is, is that he was such an impulsive liar. He had the ability to rationalize whatever engagement he was having at the time because I also recall a service where he told us the reason he was involved at times with other women is because as a man he has his needs too and his wife had a severe back problem and she acknowledged it that she indeed did have a severe mm -hmm. back problem mm -hmm. and she wanted him to have his needs fulfilled so it really did not bother her. And then there were times when he would explain to us that he had engaged in an illicit affair with someone and it was for money because they were giving a large, large sum of money to quote unquote, the cause. Or either it was a situation where he, out of the kindness of his heart, he put himself in a humiliating position to protect us from harm that could have been brought up on us had he not uh, conceded to the advances of some women. So and and the I want to also, I'm let, sorry, let me the also add for because, I'm sorry. Um, I want to add this too, because I don't want that to be, um, I want to make sure people heard that. Uh, and I want to be really clear when I say this, uh, this is nothing homophobic. Everybody knows I am a gay man. This is nothing homophobic whatsoever, but I just want to make sure people heard it that he also admitted to having sex with men. Absolutely. Uh, which mm. I still, it's, it's just, it just shakes me up. Like, 
these are, you know, I'm thinking elderly people might be more conservative. Like, how does this not, boom, make people say, yo, what's going on here? Again, um, well, I'm, I'm sorry. So go, go, go ahead, Mr. Herbert, is, then Ms. Leslie. With, with, with Jim Jones, I remember him saying, you know, um, whatever you uh, see me as, that's what I am to you. That's what I'll be for you, you know? Whether you, whether you want to call me father, I'll be your father. You want me to be such and such or such and such or such and such, that's what I'll be to you. Or that's what I'll be for you. You know, so he was trying to fit into everybody's um, needs or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so it was, I guess it was easy for people to um, accept that. Rationalize uh, it that way. Go ahead, Miss right. Leslie. I'm sorry. The church mantra was basically uh, the means justify the ends. Well, we yeah. heard that all the time. The means justify the ends, which meant, I mean, we were not raised with any moral standards. I will tell you that. My first uh, and you talk about, you know, in the 70s, um, someone openly gay was not, I mean, I wasn't, I didn't even know that, it, I didn't know it existed, but it was because he rationalized everything. And I think that, again, the means justified the ends. That's that's what we were taught. And I and think that the a, larger, he's... go ahead, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Ms. Williams. He was a very complex uh, personality and a paranoid man. So he would make it a point to always appear as though he was speaking personally to you. He had that mm -hmm. type of uh, ability and he was able to read his audience so well mm -hmm. that you dared not really go into severe questioning of anything that he did because of course there would be always consequences yes. if you question too much even corporal punishment i heard uh yes. to be honest with you what you just said miss williams that kind of sounds like like trump to be honest with you All right, exactly listen, uh, that's we, what i said he, he it's very trump interesting is jim jones <laughs> right so we have to head to a break we're going to come back and then i want to talk about uh Jonestown, Guyana. And uh, we are talking about cults and we're talking to three survivors of the uh, Jonestown massacre in Guyana on November 18th, 1978. Over 900 people were either murdered or committed suicide, the majority of those being Black people. Uh, I want to go, I want to introduce, I want to bring our panel back on, but I would like for y'all to tell me um, who you lost at the Jonestown massacre. Uh, we'll start with Miss Williams. I believe that you lost cousins, correct? It was just it was cousins. Mm -hmm. Lost cousins, mm -hmm. um, Mister Mister Herbert New New Newell. Who did you lose in the Jonestown massacre? Okay, I lost I lost a host of uh, family, um, starting with my mother, my oldest sister, my three baby brothers, my baby sister, uh, my little nephew, three cousins, a nephew and a niece. 11 total. Miss hmm. Leslie Wagner Wilson, who did you lose? Uh, I lost my mother, Inez, who was 50. I lost my sister, Michelle, who was 24. I lost my baby brother, my only brother, Mark, who was 16. Uh, my husband, Joe Wilson. I lost my uh, niece, Danielle, and my nephew, Duran. And of course, you know, immediate, that was immediate family. Well, may they uh, continue to rest in power. Uh, and, oh, thank and, you. Yeah, may thank they you continue to rest in power. Uh, I want to start with you, Mr. Herbert, because I, I know you, you have to leave after the first hour. So I just want to start with you for a moment, uh, okay. just to try and, and, and summarize uh, for folks who may not know, uh, part of the reason why Jim Jones uh, goes to Guyana is because he's, he's under investigation. Uh, there are people accusing the church of, uh, in a, of you know, sexual misconduct, then the IRS. And so he's under investigation. So he has this idea to go to this utopia and this quote unquote utopia is, uh, is um, Guyana. So one of the big questions that people have is, uh, is getting on that plane, going to Guyana, following this man. Um, Mr. Herbert, what, what at this point, are you 20? Do I have that correct? Yes, I was 20 years old um, at the time when um... When I went over there, um, it was a group of 60 of us. We left San Francisco, um, 
we had uh, two bus loads of the church buses go from uh, San Francisco to uh, Florida. And um, we got to Florida and the next day we um, caught a flight, you know, to, um, to uh, Guyana. Uh, we had a layover in Trinidad and we finally got to, um, to um, Georgetown um, that evening, that afternoon evening. Mr. Herbert, did you have any hesitation? Was any part of you thinking, mm, I'm not sure about this? I had butterflies the whole time, you know, um, getting on that plane, but um, all my other family members were already over there. You know, so I was the last family member to, to go over there. You know, my mom and brothers and sisters, they were already there. So, um, of course, I wanted to go over there to see them, to be with them, and, you know, hearing so much about uh, uh, Jonestown and all the wonderful things that's supposed to have been happening there. There were videos, there were promotional videos that came Correct. out. Correct. Correct. Yeah. So it, it was, it was an anticipation that you want to be there. And, and you said earlier, your father wasn't involved. So your father just stayed behind. Correct. My father didn't have, he didn't want to have nothing to do with um, my mom really joining the church or, or moving up to San Francisco or going to South America. Hmm. All right. So I, I'm going to, I'm going to go to Miss Leslie and, uh, and uh, Miss Yolanda story, but I just want to make sure I just talk with you for a minute, Mr. Herbert. So the day the massacre happens and I'm sure, you know, you know, uh, there's these, these um, suicide drills and he's doing this manic speaking over a loudspeaker. But the day the massacre happens, uh, you were actually not in Jonestown. You're in a neighboring town doing some work. Is that accurate? Well, um, I was told to take our boat because we had a, a 40 foot uh, fishing trawler called the Cudjo. And um, I had just got my breakfast that morning and um, me and the other guy that worked on the boat, um, we were told to, I had just got my breakfast and walked out of the breakfast line. And one of the guys on the security team told uh, me and him were to take the boat and go down the river and bring it back the next day. And of course, um, on, the way, uh, on the way down there, on the way to the boat, the guy that took us to the boat, um, Ed Crenshaw, he's telling us that, you know, when we get back, you know, everyone is gonna be dead and we're gonna just go back to the States and start kicking it like we used to. You know, mm -hmm. I, I didn't, I told him, no, I don't think that's not gonna happen. You know, so I, I, I really didn't think it was, it was that bad because I was down the river the week before that getting everything out of the store because we had a store down the river and we had brought everything from out of the store back to um, Jonestown. And so I didn't hear all what was going on that week leading up to um, the congressman coming there. Yeah, and the, so, the congressman, uh, uh, California congressman, congressman Leo Ryan. There. Yeah, Leo Ryan to, to do a story and he's eventually shot and killed. I, I wanna ask you this, uh, Mr. Herbert, um, as a, from a, just a black man's perspective, what I read is that the work down there was brutal. Uh, the majority of the black folks were working on the fields, that Jim Jones inner circle was all white. He had all these black folks in his, in his, in his uh, as far as being members, but they were all white. And I'm curious to know was there ever any conversation like there is um, this white man that is, it almost sounded like a plantation to me when I read it. Was there ever, ever a conversation of thinking like, yo, this is feeling really strange that why does this white dude have all this power over us? No, I mean, uh, if you did feel that way, you kept it to yourself, you know, because uh, you couldn't, he may... He made you think that uh, you couldn't really trust talking to the, the next person. Say, like, if I uh, felt the way I couldn't tell Leslie that, you know, feeling a certain way, fear that she might go back and tell uh, Jim, or if I wanted to leave Jonestown or felt like I wanted to leave Jonestown, I couldn't share with anybody else, you know, and, and whether you thought that uh, all the white people that was in higher authority was right or wrong, but there was a few black people that uh, had high positions also, you know, mm -hmm. such as um, what was it, Johnny Brown or Jim McElvain, you know, um, these guys or 
uh, there was a couple other guys also, you know, but his inner inner circle, I believe they were, you know, white women or they were you white know. women. A lot of people, you know, folks got to realize that Jim Jones was high as a kite and he had to have these women around him uh, to release people around him to really orchestrate all this happening. And I'm sorry, I'm fast forwarding. I, I want to go back, but this was really striking to me. And I, I do want to talk about your family as well. But when the massacre happens, after it happens, the authorities lock you up. They put you behind bars because they believe you might be a part of, of killing congressman, the congressman. I was really struck by that, that that kind of happens today, that you're wrongfully behind bars uh, because they think you may have been a part of this as you just lost your entire family. Just speak to that right. for a minute. Correct. At the time, at the time when, because um, we, we had um, went down river and we docked our boat and we started, we got there around what, four in the afternoon, three or four o'clock in the afternoon. And um, we started cleaning up our boat and uh, like one o'clock. Uh, in the morning, a guy in his army came to our boat and uh, arrested us. And um, they look at the timeline and it just didn't match. But um, we they they all they just put us in jail that night. And the next day, Sunday morning, they came back there and told us that you know 400 some people were dead up in Jonestown. And so I'm thinking, you know, by the being only by him saying only 400. First, I didn't want to believe him, but then I thought back to um, when we got in off the boat that Thursday night, he was talking about he was going to be like Chief Joseph. You know, this is going to be his last battle if, battle if Leo Ryan came there. You know, and then I'm thinking uh, about what Ed Crenshaw told us on taking us to the boat, you know, that when we got back, we all gonna be, all of them going to be dead. And so after uh, the, the, the Army official came back there and told us that, you know, so many people were dead up in there in Jonestown, I said, oh, my God. You know, it was just devastating. But by him saying only 400, I'm thinking maybe the other half ran to the jungle and got away. But, you know, as the days went by, the numbers got higher and higher and higher, you know? And I'll, me and Clifford, we were on the boat. We're down the river from everybody else. We don't know if everyone in um, Jonestown is really dead. We don't know if everyone in um, Georgetown, the capital, at the headquarters is dead. You don't. We, we just. It was. It was an awful feeling, a lonely feeling, you know. Mr. Yeah, Herbert, do you think if you would have? Do you think if you would have been in Jonestown that day, do you think that you would have committed suicide or or be murdered? Became murdered? I probably would have been murdered. I probably would have been murdered. You know, because, um, you know, I think back, I think back to um, one of the white nights he had when uh, we first, when I first arrived there, he had all 60 of us in that group uh, to come up, to stand up in the line. And he uh, asked us what we would do, what we would do if we were uh, attacked by mercenaries or whatever. And this went on from, we uh, start out, you know, you go to work in the morning, come in for lunch, go back out for the afternoon work, and then you uh, finish around five o'clock. So he calls an alert at five o'clock. So this goes on from five o'clock in the afternoon to like two or three, four o'clock in the morning. You know, you up all this whole time. And he's um, asking everyone in the group, what would you do if, um, if we was attacked by mercenaries? Would you stay and fight? Would you run or would you just give up? You know, so I'm so tired that, you know, I'm thinking if I can just get some sleep, you know, I gladly fight tomorrow, mm. you know, but um, yeah, I figured that was another way of him brainwashing us by, you know, conditioning your mind, you know, keeping you up at all these all types of hours, you know. And your uh, your mother and the rest of your family who you lost. Uh, it, it, is there any details? Is there any accounts of, of what happened with them? No, I heard, I heard one of my brothers, um, the one next to me, um, the, the poison or whatever didn't work quite well with him and they had to give him another shot or something to that effect. Mm. Um, um, 
Uh, as far as the other ones, I'm not sure exactly, you know, um, yeah. uh, what, how they met their demise. I, I heard uh, Jim Jones's son, his biological son, because he adopted a black son in Indiana and did like a big press thing about it. It was so uh, silly from my perspective from outside <laughs> looking in. But uh, Jim Jones' son said that his father was a stone cold racist, that he wasn't yelling the N-word all over the place, but he was definitely a racist. Yes. Um, what, what are your thoughts on that, Mr. Herbert? I wish I had known, you know, but... Um... I didn't see I didn't see the signs of it that he was a racist, you know. Even though I was one of his um, what they call apostolic guardians, that you know, when when he's on stage, you know, you're he has one person on each side of him, and you know, wherever he went, you know, um, we went with him. Um, I never saw any signs of it, but you know, I wasn't in the inner circle to hear and see all what he said, you know. So. How do you how do you get through? Uh, and I again, I'm I'm gonna get to uh, Miss Leslie and Miss Miss Yolanda, but I do want to know how did you get through the trauma? It, it's something I I can't imagine, and it's constantly referenced in pop culture. It's constantly spoken about. How do you get through the trauma of losing so many of you, so many folks in your family? Um, when it first happened, um, I didn't really want to come back to the United States, but. Um, my mother-in-law at the time, um, I was going to stay in South America because I didn't want to come back here and have anyone saying, I told you so, or, you know, I told you this is going to happen or, you know, but uh, my mother-in-law, she sent me a plane ticket to come back. And that changed my whole thinking of um, people still love you. There are some people that still love you, you know, so that changed my whole thinking because um, my, uh, my kid's mother, and because I had two kids, uh, two young kids when um, when I was in, we was in the church, and he wanted to send one of one of the kids over, and my uh, wife at the time, and she went to she wanted to go up and ask him, or she went up and asked him if she can go see her mother before um, before she left, and he told her instead of your mother shimmy shaking her behind with Ray Charles and her Ray Letts, she should be here helping the cause. And so she took both kids and left the church and came back to Los Angeles. And so uh, after this happened, um, her mother told her that, you know, I was going to need her help, you know, so because we had separated, you know, she was here in Los Angeles and I was over in South America. And so after it happened, you know, uh, my ex and my kids, my young kids, they were my, they were my support. They were, they was what uh, gave me something uh, to continue living for. And of course, you know, my mother-in-law at the time, she helped me a lot, you know, through it. And um, that's what gave me the will to live. I mean, I know I had lost most of my family, but you know, you still got to survive. You can't just give up, you know? Mm -hmm. That was, that uh, was. Yes, yes, definitely, absolutely. Uh, can you tell people out there, because uh, again, I don't think being in a cult is a white thing at all. Can you tell people out there uh, who may be in, a, or maybe they're exposed to a cult, maybe they have friends or family who are, you know, they feel like they're in a cult. Uh, what are the signs you may have missed that people should pay attention to now? Um, someone always um, um, orchestrating your life, your movements, your thoughts, or what have you telling you what you can do, what you can't do or what you should do or what you shouldn't do, you know, restricting, restricting your, um, uh, conversation with your family, friends, you should just, uh, you know, saying that, you know, you should just be involved with, um, the people of the organization, you know, uh, they don't want you to have no outside contact with, um, the, the real world, I would say, you know, um, be careful of all that, you know, so. And, and where, where, where is your soul? Where is your spirit now when it comes to faith or, or religion or what you believe in? I really trust in that there is, a uh, there's a, a living God, a true God, you know, other than man, you know, cause you know, 
You know, the Bible says, you know, there are a lot of uh, people coming that's out there that will deceive you, you know, like ravaging wolves that, you know, just waiting to devour you, you know. So um, a lot of the word, you know, is true. And um, you just, like you say, you have to decipher it for yourself. Do you think Jim Jones was a, was a version of Satan? I truly believe he was a, a version of Satan, a false prophet, teacher, whatever you want to uh, label it, you know. Mm. And um, I have my own uh, conspiracy theories about the whole thing, you know. Um, what do you mean? Uh, as far as, I don't know if it's uh, fair to say or good to say on, on TV or whatever, but Ever since way back when, you know, when they were trying to get rid of our leaders, you know, and our people, you know, from Mega Evers to Malcolm to King, the Kennedys, the Black Panthers, you know, whenever we had a leader, they always seem to try to destroy our leaders where we don't have anyone to help us march forward, you know, and uh, since um uh, they crushed the panthers that was the last organization you know that was doing something for black people you know um uh, then this man comes along as a false prophet as wrong. a false prophet or i'm not sure what you want to label him uh asian other government or i don't know you know mm. um gather up all these black people have the resources to gather up all these black people take them to south america and you already have this poison with you or you bring this poison in. I just want to finish our conversation, Mr. Herbert. Uh, to summarize, uh, you think there's something, so this is your opinion. Again, you are a Jonestown survivor. You lived it. You didn't do an outside doc on it. You lived it. And you believe that uh, there is something suspicious about uh, Jim Jones and the time that he comes about. Just explain that to what you were saying. Yes, I mean, because... Um, uh, when we when I joined the church, you know, he, he was talking about socialism and communism and um, the church being uh, having informants in it and stuff. And then when we go over to South America, you know, he's talking about, you know, um, uh, Cuba, China, Russia, you know, of course, you know, uh, United States and, and uh, Russia uh, was at odds at that time. And my theory is, you know, um, I'm not sure if he was maybe a part of some secret organization or something where let's gather up all these black people, take them over there and kill them. That way we'll eliminate another group of people that, you know, that's not thinking American, you know, or, you know, uh, I just have my, my thoughts about it. I mean, the, the resources to be able to do that is really. And who knows what, where all those resources came from. I want to know y'all's story as well, too, but I would love to know, uh, uh, Miss Leslie and Miss Yolanda, what, do you, what are your thoughts on that as far as Jim Jones doing what he did at that time and being able to do it? Miss Yolanda, what are your thoughts on what Mr. Herbert well, is saying? <laughs> I have always said, um, once I got there, because I was one of the members of his planning commission, that there was no way he could have been the mastermind of all of these things that happened because he was hopelessly uh, addicted to drugs. Once I arrived in uh, Georgetown, I realized after being in all night meetings with him that he was not the one who was orchestrating all of these things that were just connecting up so perfectly well. And I began to recall conversations that he had had with us where he boasted about having gone to some of the trainings uh, that the FBI agents go through and attending some classes with them, learning about brainwashing, mind control, all of these things that we hear about. He also was obsessed with books like Edgar Cayce, books about Stalin, Lenin, uh, Hitler, uh, he was obsessed with those types of leaders. And so in my mind, I begin to start to 
get extremely uncomfortable around him, around him. And then I started to, in my own mind, set up a timeline and start thinking about things. And the realization came to me that I truly believe that this was an FBI uh, assignment. He may or may not have gotten out of control, but certainly this was, I believe, a test to, of mind control and to see how far you could get someone to go. Because there's no way that anyone can tell me one person could move 900 plus United States citizens, have all of this money laundering going on, all of these retirement checks, all of these properties in San Francisco, Los Angeles, and other places throughout California being sold with under powers of attorney with three people's names that are consistently on those documents as having the power of attorney to sell primarily black owned property and businesses. That tells me clearly that there was someone else who was aiding and assisting him and it had to be somebody really high up in the government. Mm -hmm. Ms. Leslie? Mm, that's such a. <laughs> um, I just remember, you know, when we first came to People's Temple, Jim was always talking about a cave that there was going to be, which is the reason apparently he moved to California. There was a cave in somewhere in Reverend Valley that was stocked with goods in case there was a nuclear war because you, Reverend Valley would be able to withstand a nuclear war and the radiation. Um, I. I have my own thoughts about the, the end, right? How it ended, what it, what it should have been. Um, and for years, I thought the same thing. I said, maybe it's an experiment. And I still, and that's not still, I still consider that. Um, but I think Jim started, Jim started realizing once he went to Ukiah that there was no, there was no membership in Ukiah, you know? And, and the interesting thing is he moved us, he moved from Indiana with a small group of black folks, fam, a couple of families, to you, to River Valley, who's which was totally racist. That was Northern California. They had Klan. They had they were horrible to Native Americans. So he moves his community, which again the majority is white at that time, into a area that is not for Black folks. And so once he couldn't gain membership, he started going to San Francisco. And someone said, you know, Black folks are loyal. His Stephen said this. Black people are loyal. And so once he, once he began with the healings, the buses, people were coming up from, from San Francisco to Ukiah. But I think it just became a power thing. I don't know. Uh, I'm sure there's other people involved. I don't, um, I'm, not, I'm just not clear on that. And I'm not convinced of, of, of anything at this point. But I do know that once he was able to gain power and people were turning over properties, and businesses, because people think that a lot of folks that even don't know about Jonestown think that the people were just ignorant. You know, we had professionals there. We had Black Americans who were doctors and lawyers and, and in the healthcare, we had, we had everybody. We had hookers and drug addicts. And, and so it was, it was a, wide, a wide variety of people. People just weren't ignorant, but they were searching for something. So I think once he started getting this power, he came on the planning, right, the human Human Services, Human right? Rights, Yolanda, Human Rights Commission. Human Rights Commission. So his power kept growing and growing and growing. The only reason he went to Guyana was because of the article. Jim did not want to be in Closing Jonestown him. because there was no accolades. He was out of the public eye, right? right. Mm -hmm. And so once he got into Jonestown, and his plan, I believe, was to go back to San Francisco. But because of his ego, Yolanda, you mentioned drug, drug use. We, none of us knew that he was on drugs, basically. Right. Um, and so I think once, because he couldn't go back to San Francisco, because he was a prisoner in Jonestown, that it just escalated. But again, there's this whole group of people behind him that, that supported him. But what I truly do believe what, what was supposed to happen, well, we can talk about it, that in the end, if you want to talk about my, what I think happened on that day and how it was supposed to go, we can definitely talk about that. Yeah. Uh, I want to yeah. make you know, he spiraled out of control, as Leslie says, he indeed did spiral out of control. And it was because he felt that he was connected to these 900 people in a way that he would never really be able to shake us. I mean, it was expensive 
to feed 900 people sure. in Guyana yeah. if he was going to feed us the way we were supposed to be fed. However, in Guyana, we did not receive the proper nourishment or anything that should have been in our diets. In fact, we were deprived of nutrition. We were deprived of our medications. Medications were taken from you as soon as you arrived to Guyana because you were told, oh, you aren't going to need that anymore because father is going to heal you anyway. So you don't need these pills anymore. And he would take mm -hmm. them. What would happen with those pills? Well, um, I know that if it was something that would keep you up or make you an upper or downer, depending on it, those would go into his stockpile. Other things would just be uh, put away elsewhere for whatever purposes that they would need it for. But it was very clear and evident to me that he was totally under the influence of drugs consistently, daily, day and night. And the unfortunate thing was I had to come to the realization that my sister was right when she first encountered him. Although he helped her get out of prison because of his the attorneys the church attorneys got her out of prison she looked him in the eye in the san francisco church and told him you ain't nothing but a drug addict take those glasses off i know what you do you do heroin and crack and everything and i was shocked when my sister dared to say something like that to jim jones you are you crazy he helped you what are you what's wrong with you girl and so literally she was thrown out of his church and she was told never to come back again, which she didn't care. And she never did come back. But it's interesting that she, she was a drug addict, but she was able to determine mm. just on a few encounters with him, who he was and what he was doing and what he was about. Miss um, Leslie, let's go to you. Uh, you were there um, that morning. I believe you told your mother that you were going on a picnic. Um, explain a little bit of, of what that morning was like and maybe even uh, the uh, days leading up to it. Um, so we knew that the Congressman was coming and um, we didn't know when we knew it was probably going to be some something happening that was gonna be negative, but the days before, um, I had met with the woman, Diane Louie, who said her husband was building, finding uh, an escape route out of Jonestown. I asked to go. And so there was no date. Um, I was quiet because I was married to Joe Wilson and I didn't want them to think that I was a spy. Um, I told her I was taking my son. So a couple of weeks later, they said, you know, you're approved to go, but you won't know who else is in the group for their own protection. Um, that the day before on November 17th, the plane we saw a plane flying overhead and the siren went off. And this is a siren that warns everybody to get to the pavilion, which is the main community area. We dropped our, you know, we ran um, towards the pavilion. I remember going in the kitchen and grabbing a knife and sticking it down the front of my jeans because I just for protection. And so they called everyone to the pavilion. Marceline, Jim's wife was there. And she <laughs> says, um, get, get in, you know, put on your Sunday's finest. Uh, don't speak with anyone unless you're told that you can have a conversation. And so we went back and we got dressed. We took our showers. We tried to put on something decent. Um, and then later on, we had dinner. And Diane says to me, Diane, I was on the steps of the um, pharmaceutical, you know, the pharmacy. And she says, they're feeding the, the pigs before the slaughter. And I said, Diane, don't say that. Don't say that. And so she said, we're going to leave tonight. You know, later on she comes to me and says, Richard says, we're going to leave tonight. And so you've seen the clips of everyone, you know, screaming and hollering and dancing and pretending to be happy. You won't ever see a clip of me in Jonestown. I always stayed in the background. Um, and so Congress, Congressman Ryan is there and he's, you, you've seen the videos. So that night I went to my mom and I said, mom, I said, there's something wrong. And she says, baby, I'm tired and she was 50. And I said, there's things I'm seeing. I worked in the medical field. I worked with Dr. Shaq. I was supposed to be sent to Cuba to become a doctor, me and another person. Um, and so I worked with Larry Shaq and I, I saw the discrepancies of care. Some people had services. There's people that should have been sent 
to Georgetown because of their diseases like lupus to see a specialist. They were denied those visits because they might have been considered um, a flight risk. And or and they only sent the ones who were in the hierarchy, right? That were that were somebody on their in their terms. And so I saw this discrepancy and I thought, well, wait a minute, we're supposed to be loving on each other. And I saw that, that was that had pretty much dwindled to nothing. But I realized this is, I have to get my son out. And so I told my mom, mom, I'm just seeing things that are not, that are not right. And she goes, ba you know, baby, I'm tired. So my plan was to leave, go get my dad, who was part of the concerned relatives, and come back and get the rest of my family out. Um, so we decided, so I was told we're going to leave on the 18th. The community was so tense, you can cut it with a night. It was just this quietness, just a quietness before the storm. And I remember seeing Johnny Cobb and I said, Johnny, and he goes, not right now. He was, not right now, not right now. Everybody was in this kind of frantic, you know, motion. So we were supposed to meet at the, at the kitchen at 10 o'clock, 10-ish, 9.30-ish or so. And I got there and I had Jakari with me, you know, our son, who was three at the time. And, uh, there was not a lot of movement. Um, someone said to me, your sister wants you, Richard's just not, you can't, you can't go. We have, we have to go. But once I saw who was coming with us, I was shocked. I, I never would have thought that they were unhappy because you did not show your emotions. You just, you just did not. You couldn't trust anyone. I couldn't trust my mother to say that I was leaving because I believe that she might've thought and told thinking it was for my own good. Right. And so, um, Joe came to me and he says, where are you going? And I sit on a picnic. He goes, it's not a good day. No one thought once you said picnic that you can't go make a sandwich. The kitchen is closed. There's no refrigerator where you can go make a picnic. But it was such a ridiculous ideal. Thank God for Richard Clark, you know, giving us that excuse. It didn't even register. So he gave me my son back. Uh, I mean, he took my son and then I went to see my mom at the library. And I said, mom, I'm going on a picnic. And she looked at me because she knew her daughter. Like, what are you, what are you into? What are you thinking about? Um, and I said, we're going on a picnic. And she goes, a picnic? And she just looked at me with wonderment. Like, I'm sure you're not going on a picnic. And I was able to hug her and kiss her and tell her I loved her, not knowing that was the last day I was going to see her. So we started trekking down this road that Richard Clark, you know, the main road, and I had no idea which way we were going because I, I didn't ask. I didn't want them to be suspicious. Um, and so um, Stanley Gig comes on the tractor down the road and he says, where are you going? We're going on a, on a picnic. And he's like, get back to the, get back to the compound. They're on the way back. The entourage is coming back in. Um, so later on, we would discover we got lost in the jungle and there was 11 of us. It was 11 black folks. We, there's, a, there's 11 black people that were the resistance, right? In that time. Uh, Richard Clark, I call my Moses. Diane Louie, I call my Harriet Tubman because without them, I would not be here today. Hmm. We got lost in the jungle um, because Richard was trying to grab a package and we heard the tractor, the trailer coming with the guests. We dove on the right-hand side, which is on the right-hand side of the, of the security shack. And we got lost. And then we end up so close that we could hear the conversation at the, at the, at the gate, at the, guard, at the guard shack. And so when we finally made clearing, Richard says, we're gonna go to Park, Park Kaituma. That was his plan. He, his trail was on the other side through the piggery to go to Port Kaituma, which was all the, where all the shootings were. And I just said, I can't, I can't go to Port Kaituma. It's too, it's too close. You know, if Joe finds me, my husband, and we were estranged at the time, he'll, he's going to kill me. He'll, he'll kill me. You, you thought your husband would, would shoot you? Oh, he, he would. Have. Your husband? Oh, yes. Because he, he was would a have. part of security? Yes, wow. he would have. Yes, he would have shot me. He had pulled a gun on me before in Jonestown. Um, wow. Yeah. And so um, we had exchanged phone numbers and I said, if I don't make it, just get my son out. Just, just get my baby out. You know, here's my dad's number, but let me, if, if you, if you see him killing me, go, you know, you guys try to get out. Here's contact information in case some of us didn't make it. We can contact, you know, our families, the families of those and, and let them know what happened. And Richard says, well, Matthews Ridge is over 30 miles away. And I said, I have, I have to go to Matthews Ridge. I cannot go to Port Kaituba. I cannot. 
And that's why I wouldn't choose to go with the congressman. I knew I wouldn't make it. I, I knew that I wouldn't make it. And so we proceeded to follow this railroad track, you know, um, and walk and walk and walk. And, and uh, I had your car on a sheet, tied to a sheet with my back. And a couple of guys would help me we back and forth. And we walked and we walked, we walked and we saw this train pass. And the conductor looked out at us like, what are they, what are these? Cause it's dirty, it rain, we're filthy. Why are these people on the road with these kids? And he, the train kept going. And so we sped up. We said, we better get to Matthews Ridge because we don't know who he's gonna tell that, that, you know, that he saw us. By the time it, it, it was dark, I don't know how many hours we had been walking, it was a long time. And the train came back and Richard says, we're gonna get on the train if the train stops and we're going to get someone to take us to a phone booth so we can call the US Embassy. Uh, we got on the train, um, the train, he, the conductor stopped and they found someone to take us to a phone booth. We ended up at the police station and the police had drawn weapons on us because we didn't know what happened in Matthews Ridge. We had no idea what had happened at Matthews Ridge. And he at said, the sorry? At, at the airstrip. At yeah, the, the airstrip. Where the congressman had, was killed. Yeah, yeah we, had, we had no idea that the, that the There's no cell phones. Been. There's no text messaging. <laughs> yeah. There's no nothing. There's no yeah. smoke signals because we don't have matches. <laughs> There's nothing, right? There's right. nothing. They had, um, a two, they had a two-way radio, you know, they, they could radio into Jonestown, you know, that way. But as far as telephones, anything like that, no. Go ahead, Leslie. Um, so the conductor came up and he said if they were not there. They were on the road at this certain time. And so, the, so they, they let us come up into the police station. And so we didn't know if it was friend or foe. Because Jim had said, anyone, if any of us escape, Guyana knows that we're supposed that we will be arrested. This is this is the, the garbage he was feeding us. And so we didn't know if it was friend or foe. And the captain said, We heard it was a concentration camp. We yeah. heard it was a concentration camp. The captain said that. He heard the it captain, was a concentration camp. He said we heard it was wow. a concentration camp. That was that was what the rumors were in in, in Matthews Ridge. Um, and so the men stayed up with us, you know, they fed us, they put us on cots, the men stayed up to guard us. And in, in the wee hours of the morning, I heard these military helicopters flying overhead. And I woke Diane, I'm, you hear what's going on? Why is the military coming in? And then uh, the captain came in early in the morning. He said, Here, the report is, as he, Herbert said, 500 dead and 500 have run into the jungle. And we're 500 dead, how? They don't have any reports. They just know that was the initial report. And so I just, we all broke down. We were, we were devastated. And I was just praying that one of my family members made it out. Right. One of them made it out. And um, I never, you know, um, they flew us to Georgetown the next day. And we met with this woman from the State Department who says, uh, we're going to fly you home, but you're going to sign an affidavit promising to pay us back eleven hundred dollars wow. once you get back to the states. That's yeah, that was our welcome. I'm glad you're okay. Um, and so, of course, um, you know, I had my son with me, and that was the main purpose to to get out. Um, and we, they kept us in a in a hotel in Georgetown. The first call I made was to my to my dad. And the first thing he said was, why didn't you get your brother out? Hmm. And my, my brother was my mother and father's natural child. And then I realized I didn't have a dad any longer. You know, I was, a, I, now I was an orphan. Wow. I called my grandmother, the Reverend Cook picked up the phone and I could hear her screaming in the background. And, then, and he says, you know, well, I'm, I'm sorry. He said, we almost lost her. My grandmother got on the phone. She goes, I prayed for one. I prayed for one. I prayed for one. And the Lord sent me two. And so um, I called Joe's parents. His mother was upset because he had been already titled an assassin. And so that first like day of just making phone calls, hoping that I would get what I needed because I was still in shock. And honestly, I didn't believe her. I didn't believe everybody was gone. I just couldn't accept that. I was not ready to accept that I lost my entire family. I just wasn't. Um, Ms. Leslie, did, didn't you say mm -hmm. also that when you came back, 
and if I'm wrong, correct me, that you said uh, media and even folks in black media were kind of brutal to y'all. They were just really brutal. Like, what's wrong with them? How do they fall for this? Right. Uh, how did that feel to even get that from your own community? It felt horrible, but it was understandable because, you know, yeah. all the facts were not in, of course, right? We were named the death cult and we're killing our children. So I wasn't surprised because they didn't have all the information. I read the first, I, years later, I read the articles. They were, they were horrendous and they were full of lies. A lot of them were full of lies, but I felt that we were now, you know, stigmatized. Mm, labeled you know, as um, fanatics and all right. kind of crazy things. And so Versus the, 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 the real villain is Jim Jones and his <laughs> exactly. team. Exactly. That's the, that's, the, that's the devil right there. That's right. the devil right there. Well, because right. we're followers, but because we're followers, you know, we're all, we all, we fall into that whole, that category as being crazy, stupid for following this man, you know, but, um, you know, once you, well, was piggyback on what you said about uh, concentration camp, you know, once you got there, once you left Georgetown, it's a 24 hour trip from Georgetown, the capital to Jonestown, you know, by way of the boat, the Cudjo. Mm -hmm. And 24 so- 24 hours? 24 wow. hours. It's a 24 hour trip. You leave wow. the Georgetown, the capital, the harbor that uh, afternoon, evening, you're on the ocean all night. Uh, by the time morning comes, you're at the mouth of the river leading up to um, uh, Port Kaituma. So you're on this river, this winding river all day long. And by the time um, it's about what, five o'clock in the evening, uh, you reach Port Kaituma. And then uh, you got to off offload the, the boat with the people and their supplies or whatever. By that time, it's what, six or seven o'clock in the evening when, it, when it's dark. And over there in South America, um, uh, if there's no moon, it's pitch black. You know, so you're going down the road on this tractor trailer, you know, you, all you see is trees and stuff on the, on the side of you and there's just a little dirt road in front of you. Uh, by the time you get to Jonestown, then you see all these lights. But um, once you enter that front gate, um, for, the most, for most people, that's the last time you saw that front gate. You know, mm. and um, um, even if uh, even if you wanted to leave, you didn't. He always told you or telling you that you know there's snakes and tigers and all these different right. things out there in the jungle. So you were you're afraid. in the jungle. Yeah. You're in the jungle, so you're scared to run away. If yeah. you did want to run away, and so you wouldn't, you would, you didn't know which way you're to trapped. go. You're trapped. The, literally, and, what you're explaining it reminds me of slave narratives that I've read of enslaved people trying to escape a plantation. That's literally what it, it sounds like that. I, I wanna to get to, to Miss Williams, but I do wanna ask you really quick, Miss Leslie. Uh, you said that your mother who was 50 said, I'm tired, I'm tired. Uh, do you think when your mother said that, do you think she knew, did, did something in her spirit know what, was, what, what may have been coming? I, that's a very good question. She may have. She may have known. I, I think part of that was thinking about, oh my gosh, this 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 isn't working, and having to go back to the United States with nothing. My mother was a business owner, a homeowner, gave give, gave up all that, and facing my dad and other other maybe my grandparents. So I think she was tired, and she may have she may have suspected in her spirit that her days were numbered. There, that is that is a great possibility. I do want to get the story of Miss. Uh... Yolanda Williams, uh, Miss Williams, if I have this right, uh, you left a week or two before, correct? You were you, no, you, you no, escaped. No, no. Oh, I'm sorry. I left, uh, I left in a year almost before. I left in June of '77. Uh, June hmm. of '77, I was back at the United States. How did you leave? Why? Why did you leave earlier? As soon as I got off of the plane and and landing at, in the Georgetown. Uh, we were picked up, but prior to us getting into the van with one of the uh, temple members who was uh, to pick us up from the airport, I noticed that we suddenly had articles that were not our property that were suddenly um, in with our articles. And then I said, those aren't our, our, our boxes. I don't know what that is. And suddenly I'm told by 
another council member. Oh, don't say anything. We need that for the missionary project. So I just left it alone. When we got to the capital, to uh, La Maha Gardens, which was where our headquarters were, I saw these big guns coming out of these crates. And all of a sudden I said, uh-uh, something is going wrong here. We're supposed to be an agricultural missionary project. What do we need all these big guns for? At the time, I didn't know there were rifles or anything because I was not, I had never been exposed to that type of stuff. But then they stripped us of our passports. They asked for our passports and they demanded any US currency that we had. Well, I was smart enough not to give them all of the money, US dollars that I had. But at the same time, um, I was fortunate enough to primarily stay in the capital because of my ability to be able to procure goods for reduced prices for the church because um, they were trying to keep to a very strict, strict budget, which meant we didn't have the food that was afforded to Jim Jones. He was eating steaks, eggs, bacon, everything that you would think you could eat in the United States. Whereas we were eating, I had one time to fix fish head soup, which I've never made fish head soup. But that was what we had. And he told, oh they God. told me to prepare something. Fish head soup, outrageous mm. with all of the money that he had pouring in. Then they started uh, censoring the mail, incoming and outgoing. So when I would go out to procure goods, I found a way to get letters, sneak letters, make sure nobody was following me because we were told don't ever try to go to the consulate because if you do, we'll know and you will be punished. Okay, so I would sneak to the post office. I had a Guyanese citizen that I would pay money to to get phone calls to the United States. This is how I knew then suddenly that Jim Jones did not, was not a prophet. This is when I knew absolutely for sure because he kept saying, I don't know how people in the United States, these media and everything, we're in all night meetings. He said, I don't know how they're finding out all these things that are going on here. It's just incredible. Never did he know that I was the one leaking the information back here to the United States, to my family, to get to the media. Um, when, I, um, when I finally was able to get one of the most important letters out, which changed the course of everything for me, because after seeing Jonestown, after seeing the mistreatment and witnessing a young man being put in a six foot trench because he dared to try and escape Jonestown. And then being told at night to be careful, don't try and wander away because you don't know what's out there in the jungle. Hearing his voice 24 hours a day, seven days a week, nonstop over the airways, on the radios, in the, in the compound, and even in uh, the capital where, we, where I primarily stayed. Having visited Jonestown twice, recognizing there was no real toilets, there was no toilet tissue provided. As far as shower heads for showers, that didn't exist. It was just water running out of a pipe. And then I started to really panic because I remembered him showing us the movie Night and Fog repeatedly and then seeing uh, barricades and showers that looked and resembled very much like what was used to gas Jewish people, the Jewish people. And then I really, really said, I've got to get out of this place some kind of way. So I took a chance. It was Jim Jones' last trip, quote unquote, to the United States because he was going to try and make everything right. So he was telling us by those of us who were working in, in the headquarters in Guyana. And I had written a letter to my mother. And in this letter, I was telling my mother I needed her to come and get me. And I had no passport, no money. And I needed her to not give them her passport if she was able to come and to tell them she had no money, but bring enough money so that she could pay for an airplane ticket for uh, my husband, my daughter, and for me. And I looked at Jim Jones's sons because they were accompanying him. Uh, it was going to be Stephen, Timmy, and Jimmy. And I had to choose which of these three sons I could trust 
to give this letter directly to my mother without it being written, read, excuse me, by one of the people that was accompanying him. So I looked at Jimmy and I pulled him to the side and I said, look, Jimmy, I got something really personal. I need to tell my mom. I don't want anybody to know because it's really embarrassing. Can you give it to her? I, do you love me? Do you really understand? I said, we've always had such a great relationship. Can you do this for me? And he told me he would. I said, please promise me you're not going to show it to anybody. It's really personal. He said, I, I'll give it to her. I, I promise you, Yolanda. I said, okay, I really appreciate it, Jimmy. And I hugged him and I handed him the letter. When they got to Florida and they landed, Jim Jones was standing there in the presence of my dad and my mother. Because my dad and mother were <laughs> left in Florida to greet the temple members before they then boarded the KLM Dutch Airlines to go over to um, South America. So Jimmy handed a letter to my mother. And when he handed it to my mother, my mother just immediately put it inside of her bra. Great, great thing that she did. And then suddenly my mom told me later on when she got where she needed to get to that Jim Jones had scolded Jimmy and asked him if that letter was read by anybody and telling him, you don't give something to somebody without it being read. And he go, I, I, it was read, they read it, they read it. And so, and so my mother said she was waiting for him to try and get the letter from her. It was gonna be a fight in the airport, but she did read it when she got back to the hotel that they were um, staying in. And within a few weeks, without me even knowing if the letter had gotten to her or not, a taxi cab pulled up to the home and a guy in these cab driver came out and he goes, is there some Americans that live here? And I said, why, who wants to know? And he goes, well, I have a lady, an American lady in here and she's looking for some missionary project. So I said, well, tell her to get out and let me see who she is. Because again, I was afraid. I didn't know what was going on. I didn't know if it was somebody was set up to, to do something to me because they found out that I had been the one that was getting out all of this information. So I was on pins and needles for like two weeks. And suddenly the person that comes out is my mother. Oh my God, there was so much joy in my heart to see my mother because I knew at that point it was gonna change what, what was gonna happen to me. And when my mother got out of the cab, the only thing I could say to her is, don't give him your passport. Tell him you don't have any money. Don't give them your money, please. We gotta get out of here. Yeah. And my mother followed what I said. As soon as she got into the home, the first thing they asked her was for her passport. She told me she wasn't giving them nothing. <laughs> they asked her if she had any money. She told them, no, I don't have any money. I just have my one way round trip ticket. And they said, give us your passport because we'll protect it. She said, no, the government said no one's to have my passport but me and you're not getting it. So that night we, we made a plan, we made a pact. We never let allowed him to filter through or break our family unit. And we decided we were going to be the ones that would be bold enough to go up and tell him we didn't want to be there anymore. We we're being held against our will. And so we had to negotiate with him for over two and a half weeks to finally get him to let us come back to the United States. We had to pretend as though I was coming back so I could go to UC Berkeley to finish med school. We had to pretend like my husband was coming back because he had something to do with the previous law firm he was working in and that my mother was there because she was going to be taking care of our daughter while we did things that we had to do. But we were told, don't you ever talk. And if you ever tell anyone what's really going on here, the angels will get you. We knew what that meant. That meant he would have us killed. And so when we got back, I had to go in hiding for, a long, for quite some time. But prior to the incident, I received a call uh, from an attorney that was working with us and I had to give a deposition. 
And I was so afraid. I told him, I can't go to, to Washington or to any capital to give a deposition. I'm afraid for my life. So they brought the people um, to San Francisco. And then my deposition, I described Jonestown as a slave plantation and a concentration camp. And that we were sleep deprived. We didn't have the proper nutrients or anything. I came back to the United States with over 12 or 13 different types of infections. It took me years for some of those infections to leave my body. And I remember when Congressman Ryan called because my parents were one of the group of the concerned citizens. And he asked me what my thoughts were about him going to Guyana. I told him it was a brave undertaking, but I advised him that they had big, big weapons. I didn't know what they were called at the time, but I told him, if you wanna go and help them, make sure you bring somebody with you who also has weapons. And you know what he told me? Don't worry, I'm gonna be safe because I have the, the shield and protection of this government, of the government. I said, he asked me, he said, would you like to come? Do you, would, are you concerned about these folks? And I said, yes, I'd love to come. And I was really willing to do it, except for my parents reminded me of one thing. And that was what they told me. They said, we came once, we made arrangements, we got you. If you go back again, you're gonna be on your own. And after thinking about that, I just said, okay, then I'll do and work with whatever I can behind the scenes. And so at that point, some of the people who went with the concerned citizens over there, uh, we shared with them what we could. And they had also forced us to continue to go to church services. And so it was very difficult for me, but I had to attend the church services in San Francisco. And when people would ask me, what was it like in Jonestown? Or what was it like in Guyana? The only thing I could say is that you have to see it to believe it because I didn't want to lie. But at the same time, I knew I couldn't tell them everything that I had witnessed and seen. <clears throat> but again, as I say, it was this was one of the most horrific experiences that I've ever had in my life. And it's only by the grace of God and my faith that my family did not suffer the fate that my other 900 plus brothers and sisters suffered with the exception of Jim Jones, because again, I feel this was racial genocide. He ordered it, he allowed it to happen. It didn't have to be this way, but he was a coward and he would never ever stand up and be held accountable for his mistakes. Yet he held each of us accountable and our people paid for his crimes our people paid for it. So we have to we have to head out soon. I have to thank you. <laughs> thank you for that. First of all, I need to send this interview to somebody because this is like a movie. This is that, that this is just so I'm I'm just so touched that y'all uh, shared this this with me. Uh, we don't have much time left, but I have to I want to go to you, Miss Leslie, that mm -hmm. if you could just, you know, Dr. Uh, Mr. Herbert talked about it. Mr. Lama talked about it. If you could just quickly touch about uh, the the racial side of this, uh, this this uh, you know, this white man controlling these black folks, and then what you said earlier, what you really think uh, the end game might have been for that day. We only have like two minutes though, so if you could okay. just give us your thoughts. Um, so I think that um, it was obvious that um, you know Herbert mentioned something. It was very few black leadership, um, John. So let me put it like this: there might have been token black leadership. But Thanks. the folks that handled the money were white mm -hmm. women, young Amen. white women. They're the ones that had access to, to the money. Um, so racism did exist, even though, you know, I recognize it when Marston told me I had to go back in the fields because this white girl that I went to school with burned. So she needed to come to the doctor's office. But quickly, I believe the end result, I don't believe Jim intended to die. Mm -hmm. When they were bringing out millions of dollars into the jungle to take to the Russian embassy, the Russian embassy <laughs> came to us and we were getting Russian. We were getting lessons to speak Russia, Russian because they thought we might be sent to Siberia because it was, you know, Guyana was turned against Jim Jones. So we were, so it was, that money was not going to Ru Russia. I believe, Herbert, that that money was going to the boat 
mm-hmm. and they were going to, and I don't think Jim's plan was to die at all. There's a Thank document you. that states that they had a plan to leave the inner circle and go to Cuba mm-hmm. or to go to Cuba. That money was intended for Jim to leave mm-hmm. Guyana. Mm-hmm. He was not supposed to die. Mm-hmm. Get on that boat, get that money, those mm-hmm. millions of dollars and head to Cuba with his inner circle and his sons. Amen. Um, that's what I believe was the end was the end result. I think Marcelin probably shot him. I think she was exhausted. Mm-hmm. She was abused. She was she was you know brainwashed herself. That's, that's what his I wife. Believe was that was his wife. Him. His wife. Yes. Oh, yes. Wife I believe she she she. I believe she shot him. Mm-hmm. He wouldn't have killed himself. Well, I thought I thought if the if if the uh, basketball team, the guys on the basketball team would have been there, they would have shot Jim Jim Jones before he allowed everybody to drink that poison because they were they were all first string security. The guys that right. was there on the security force when I'm sorry, this- y'all, <laughs> we're about I to know. get shut off by the powers that be. Uh, listen, I want to say thank you so much so much for sharing the story. I have learned, I have watched documentaries. I've, I've read a lot about this, but y'all have just shed a new light on this. And I feel like the black voices of Jonestown have not been heard enough. And at this point, this is a black issue. So I really, really want to thank y'all. I really do. Uh, Once again, thank you, Dr. Dr. Herbert, not doctor, I'm sorry, Mr. Herbert Newell. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you for sharing your story. I want to thank you for allowing me to be a part of the show. I have never really uh, got a chance to share, you know, my testimony or my story, you know, so it was a pleasure, you know, being, being with you. Thank you, Miss Miss Yolanda Williams. Thank you so much. You have a blessed day. Be safe. And thank you so much, Miss Leslie Wagner Wilson. I really appreciate you.